It's my privilege to be the director of the DePaul Humanities Center, and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first installment in our year-long series, Making the Novel Novel, as we celebrate Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote on this night, the most beautiful of our lives. It's arguably the case that Quixote is the first novel ever. Some have made claims, convincing and otherwise, that there were novels in ancient Greece and China, or at least long before modernity settled into Europe. Those of you who've been with us at Humanity Center events in the past will know that for me, such categories and concepts are less interesting on an ontological level than they are on a political level. Although I'm a philosopher, bickering about the definition of the novel seems to me a hopeless and pointless metaphysical task. Concepts arise and do the work that we need them to do with the vagaries of history, chaotic as waves of time. Asking what a concept does is far more enlightening than asking what a concept is, because concepts do thinking for us and have a real effect on the world that they carve up in our name. Whether or not Quixote is the first novel or the first modern European novel, it's clear that there's something special about this book. About these books, really, because Don Quixote was written in two volumes, one published in 1605 and the second volume published a decade later in 1615. And this means that we're celebrating the 400th anniversary this year of the complete Quixote. Though, as we'll see, it's never clear that Quixote can be truly complete. We must remember, of course, the historical context that gave us this work. Shakespeare's Hamlet had appeared in print only two years before the first volume of Quixote was released. But between the publication of the first and second parts of the novel, the world was changing rapidly. The British crown had declared that all of Ireland was now under its rule. The first newspaper had just been published in Strasbourg. Galileo had discovered Jupiter's moons, causing Kepler to take up his telescope and begin publishing as well. The Spanish Armada had been defeated in the English Channel, leading to the Treaty of London, even while a new, bloody, 30 years war was just about to start, dragging Spain into more heavy losses. The plague had swept through Spanish lands as well, and in less than six years had killed 600,000 people in just this area alone. And Spain, having earlier expelled its Muslim population, now began expelling hundreds of thousands of moriscos, Muslims who had converted or been coerced into converting into Christianity. Spain's political power was still alive while Cervantes wrote, but already things were changing. Within three more decades, Spain's dominance in Europe would fade, even while overseas, the Spanish Empire would grow and continue to thrive into the 19th century. As we'll no doubt hear more about this evening, the history surrounding Cervantes informed his own experiences and his attitudes, of course, and that history is there on every page of Don Quixote. I'm going to claim that Don Quixote was the first novel, precisely because I think it points to something interesting about the idea of the novel itself. And this will become important across this academic year as we think about what it means for a novel to act like a novel. What makes it all particularly interesting, in fact, is that there at the birth of the novel is the impossibility of the novel as well, precisely because Don Quixote is first and last, creator and destroyer. It is so thoroughly postmodern rather than modern, constantly undermining itself, its authority to speak, its audience's ability to interpret, and any attempt to ground it in genre. Indeed, this will be one of the points that I believe will become a theme for us as we try to think about what and how this novel means for us today. It is, after all, a novel that begins by calling into question who the author actually is, and even the language in which the novel was originally written, before going on to morph into essentially another novel within the novel, eventually becoming an instance of the genre it supposedly is parodying and arguing against, before finally directly confronting the fact that it is a novel with the characters responding to this very fact within its pages. If a novel is a self-contained, book-length piece of prose realist fiction, then this first novel shows that such a project inherently goes against itself and is, in essence, its own impossibility. As the novel comes into being, it is something other than a novel. And this is just the first lesson that Don Quixote teaches us. 
Quixote, whatever it is, is always something of a Rorschach test for us. We see in it and in him what we want to see. And what we want to see is, of course, informed by our own past. We might think that images of Quixote have been co-opted into popular culture rather recently, though nothing could be further from the truth. In the year of the first volume's publication, there were already puppets and placards and other visual imagery of Don Quixote being used in carnival celebrations by the mostly illiterate masses. <coughs> Quixote was a consumable icon the moment he appeared on the scene in 1605, and his political meaning has been changing ever since. Don Quixote, let us recall, is a self-made man. He chooses and creates his own identity, one picked precisely in order to emulate the heroes he's been reading about in something like the historical fiction of his day, that is, the knights of a bygone era who practiced chivalry and fought for truth and honor by a medieval code. Adopting the person, person and persona of Don Quixote is the protagonist's response to reading, because we always adopt a persona when we become readers. But in this case, the other characters within the novel take the act of reading to have been precisely what drove Don Quixote into madness. Convinced that he is a knight, that his tired horse, Rosinante, is a valiant steed, and that the proudly illiterate Sancho Panza is his squire, Don Quixote attacks windmills, thinking them to be giants, and sheep, thinking them to be armies, the chaste love for his never really seen Dulcinea, always the wind at his back. Like the characters in the novel, readers sometimes think Quixote is a fool, and other times see him as a true hero. At times, that is, Quixote has been a political figure representing imprudence, and at other times, heroism in the face of overwhelming odds. As the 1900s began, and Spain recognized its crumbling colonial power, its association with Quixote changed, as all complicated relationships do, as the nation came to identify a bit more in a different way with the aging protagonist caught up in the values of a bygone era. But Quixote, of course, need not be read in this way. My own personal favorite example of the political power of a Quixote as hero interpretation comes from 21st century Venezuela, back when the late great Hugo Chavez was still around. Having lived in Venezuela for a while in the 1990s, I saw and came to be a supporter of the important work that Chavez's Bolivarian revolution had done for so many people. And it was thus little surprise when in 2005, Chavez announced Operation Dulcinea, passing out one million free copies of Don Quixote to the citizens of Venezuela, pointing to the United States and claiming, we are still oppressed by giants, and we want the Venezuelan people to get to know Don Quixote better, who we see as a symbol of the struggle for justice and the righting of wrongs. We are all going to read Don Quixote to refuel ourselves with the spirit of a fighter who came to put the world right. Viva la Revolución. That the novel and the novel's hero can accept such diverse readings is due in part to one's interpretation of what a right world looks like. There is right in the sense of getting it accurately right in terms of what the world is like right now, physically, metaphysically. And then there's right in terms of how the world should be, ethically and politically. Sometimes perhaps it takes a dreamer to make the world anew. So what and who is Quixote really? Like any good postmodern author, Cervantes immediately distances himself from his own authorship, and in so doing allows us to make of his protagonist whatever we wish. The prologue to the first part of the novel, in fact, makes this clear. Here, Cervantes writes, it can happen that a man has an ugly, charmless son, and his love blindfolds him to prevent him from seeing his child's defects. On the contrary, he regards them as gifts and graces, and describes them to his friends as examples of wit and cleverness. But although I seem like Don Quixote's father, I am his stepfather, and I don't want to drift with the current of custom or beg you almost with tears in my eyes, as others do, dearest reader, to forgive or excuse the defects that you see in this, my son. And you are neither his relative nor his friend, as you have your own soul in your own body and your own free will like anyone else, and you're sitting in your own home where you are the Lord and Master, all of which exempts and frees you from every respect and obligation, so you can say whatever you like about this history. Here, at the start, 
cervantes abandons the idea that he has any patriarchal power over his character to say who he really is and what he really means and he reminds us the readers sitting in our homes that we too can interpret this story any way we wish what a bold opening move the first novel begins by telling us that there is no one true meaning to the novel and the story to be sure would be good enough if it stopped right there but it doesn't it would be good enough to have the author claim that he has no authority, though we might always question him and wonder if such a claim is not itself believed simply because we trust that author's authority. Instead, though, what makes this novel truly unravel is that by the time the second volume came out, the author was now demanding that we accept his authorial authority. A lot can happen in 10 years. And for Cervantes, specifically what happened was that someone other than he himself published a false sequel, claiming it to be the true continuing adventures of Don Quixote. When the real Cervantes, whatever that means, finally delivers his part two, he is now demanding that we reject the false second coming and accept his version instead, not as a stepfather, but a full-blooded parent. And to make it clear, Cervantes has Don Quixote and Sancho Panza encounter the false sequel in their travels and mock it, even going so far as to refuse to go to the city of Zaragoza because the fake characters had gone there in the fake sequel. In a mind-bending bit of self-fulfilling meta-logic by way of metafiction, Cervantes' Don Quixote at one point in part two remarks that the falsely authored sequel had him going off to an adventure in Zaragoza, but quote, for that reason, I will not set foot in Zaragoza, and thus I will expose to the world the falsity of that modern historian and let the people see I am not the Don Quixote of whom he speaks. The false author published the false volume under the name of Alonso Fernandez de Avellaneda. And I admit that there's part of me that's always believed that this was in fact Cervantes himself, with Alonso playing Tony Clifton to Miguel's Andy Kaufman, the author's Jekyll and Hyde performance of identity being just another part of Quixote's quixotic story. But that there is no way to know, that there is no way to spin out of the hermeneutical circle, that is the lesson. And even to return to the inside of the narrative, as it were, the lesson gets repeated over and over. If Don Quixote was just pretending to be a knight, for instance, couldn't we accurately say that all of the so-called real knights before him were also just pretending, acting, playing a role that had been established and that they had taken up? Isn't that all any of us are doing by being the people that we are? I'm performing my identity right now for you, though this is not to say that it's a lie. It's simply to say that what identity is, is a performance, because there's never any point in life where there is no context, not a setting, a scene, calling out for a performer. I stand before you now, acting a certain way, dressed a certain way, taking up the armor of the academic in a jacket and tie, mounted atop my trusty podium, the lance of lecture notes in my hands. But later tonight, I'll merely be playing another role, trying to act like the friend, or the colleague, or the husband, and looking to those who came before me to tell me what this means, as all of you are acting right now as well, pretending to be an audience as we are all, of course, just pretending to be adults, doing the things that adults do, because, well, that's what adults are supposed to do and they always have done in the past. <clears throat> so let us say then that Quixote is mad, and yet his identity is in flux, but this is only because it's a mad thing to have an identity for all of us. And what it means to be a reader, a reader of texts, a reader of novels, a reader of each other's identity and being, is to be in a constant state of mad flux. I'll say a little bit more about this mad flux in a few minutes when we turn to the dance portion of the evening. But now we begin our time together in earnest with the first of our presenters. The first of three chapters, if you will, making up tonight's proceedings now that this prologue is out of the way. It's a meta mix of various ways into the text of Don Quixote that you may not have considered before, and which we hope will help us think collectively about the novel in a novel way. And we're lucky indeed to have four amazing scholars and artists to lead us, each presenting for a few minutes and then joining together on stage at the end of the evening for a chance to get you into the conversation as well. And so to chapter one. 
Stefan van der Elst is Associate Professor of English at the University of San Diego and Director of USD's program in Medieval and Renaissance Studies. We're also very lucky this year because Stefan is also currently a visiting fellow at the DePaul Humanities Center, where he is focused on the completion of his book, The Night, the Cross, and the Psalm, Chivalric Literature and Crusade Propaganda from the 12th to the 14th century. Finally, on top of all of his other titles, Stefan, just over a week ago, became a father. And we are pleased to have young Leo, and of course his mother Cynthia, with us in the world as well. Tonight, all cleaned up, and undoubtedly on very little sleep, Stefan is taking seriously the role that the writing and culture that surrounded Cervantes must have played in the project of Don Quixote, as he helps us think about the way in which late 16th century propaganda for the Holy War might have affected the novel and its author. I am very pleased to present to you with his lecture entitled Cervantes, Crusade, and the Hidalgo's Rusty Armor, Professor Stefan van der Elst. I have to tell you before I do so that I uh, did not expect such a large room, let alone such a large audience, and that I therefore brought a prop, which I thought would have a great effect upon you all, but from your distance it's just a tiny speck of brown leather. Um, I'll nevertheless swing it around like I am, uh, um, like there's no tomorrow. Uh, well, anyway, uh, today I would like to start uh, by briefly talking to you about the Crusades, the holy war between the Christians and various religious others in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. The propaganda uh, for the Crusade around the, uh, the time that Cervantes wrote, the Italian poet Torquato Tasso, and some uh, considerations that we might take into account when reading Don Quixote. On 7 October 1571, the guns first roared in what would later become known as the Battle of Lepanto. In the narrow gulf before the Greek town of Nopactos, the might of the Ottoman Turkish fleet, more than 250 ships strong, confronted the forces of an alliance made up of Italians and Spanish known as the Holy League, which had left Sicily a few days earlier to meet them. Although the ships of the Holy League were substantially fewer in number, about 200, they were skillfully led and far outgunned the Turkish fleet, and within the space of a day, they routed their opponents. With more than half their ships captured or sunk, and many of their capable naval troops killed, the Turks were forced to withdraw to safer waters further east. Although the Ottoman Turks replaced the ships and soldiers they had lost within a few years and continued to advance in other areas, the victory was symbolically very important for Christian Europe. Throughout the previous three centuries, the Ottoman Empire had been both relentlessly aggressive and persistently successful. Its armies had annihilated the last remnants of the Eastern Roman Empire, capturing the great city of Byzantium 1453. They had swept across the Balkans, reaching as far as the gates of Vienna in Austria in 1529. Their fleets dominated the Eastern Mediterranean, and shortly before the Battle of Lepanto, they had conquered most of Cyprus from the Venetians. The Ottomans appeared all but unstoppable. Christian victories over the Turks were rare, so when they occurred, such as at Lepanto or at the siege of Malta six years earlier, they were very good for Christian morale. After all, they showed that the seemingly invincible enemy could still be defeated and his advance checked. Perhaps equally importantly to a devoutly Christian continent, they showed that God was still on their side. <coughs> Though the conflict between the Ottomans and the Christian powers was to a great extent one between burgeoning empires, the Turkish Empire, but also in ascendant Spain, Habsburg, Austria, and the still powerful Italian maritime republics, it was quickly cast in religious terms. The Christian forces united as a holy league organized by Pope Pius V. Its soldiers and sailors were convinced they were fighting a holy war, and one of its commanders, John of Austria, encouraged his men by yelling, there is no paradise for cowards at the beginning of hostilities. But Miguel de Cervantes, who famously fought at Lepanto with the Spanish naval infantry, was shot three times and lost the use of his left hand, described as the highest and most memorable occasion uh, that past and future centuries will ever hope to see was so important because it demonstrated that the Christians were still God's elect and the protagonists of world history. If the conflict against the Ottoman Turk was envisaged as a holy war, the Christians of Western Europe were quick to associate it with other interreligious conflicts of the previous centuries, most notably with the Crusades, the series of wars it had for a few hundred years, put European Christians in control of the holy places and substantial parts of the Eastern Mediterranean literally. Writers who sought to lionize the Christian achievement at Lepanto 
and to encourage further action against the Ottomans, found inspiration especially in the First Crusade, the, mark uh, the remarkably successful campaign waged between 1096 and 1099 that had ended with the conquest of Jerusalem itself. For instance, and here of course you know, I have here a book entitled The History of the Holy War and printed in Paris in 1474. Uh, its author, Gabriel de Priot, uh, dedicated it to Jacques d'Aplincourt, a counselor to the King of France, Charles IX, so that he may read it and be inspired. After a number of dedicatory poems, you know, the likes of which Cervantes was, of course, mercilessly skewered, uh, mercilessly skewered in uh, Don Quixote, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, he offers a French translation of the Chronicle of William of Tyre, a history dated between 1170 and 1184 of the First Crusade and the first century of Christian dominion in the East. Dupleo undoubtedly hoped that reading about a successful holy war would breed successful holy war. However, perhaps more important for our purposes in this context are the writings of the 16th century wunderkind turned madman Torquato Tasso. Tasso, arguably the most important Italian poet of the 16th century, was born in 1544 in Naples and died in Rome in 1595, aged only 51. It is very likely that Cervantes, who was stationed in Naples between 1570 and 1575, knew and admired the work of Tasso, and it is thought that he, and it is thought that he was especially influenced by the Italian, this, uh, Italian's discourses on the heroic poem. Tasso's most important work is undoubtedly that known as the Jerusalemme Liberata, or the Liberation of Jerusalem, which he completed only a few years after the Battle of Lepanto. In 1575. As the title gives way, it is a retelling of the history of the First Crusade, for which he too drew material from the Chronicle of William of Tyre, the source of Gabriel de Priot. The avowed purpose of Tasso's poem was the same as that, as that of Dupriot's translation, to incite Western Europe to continue the war against its Muslim adversaries, which had taken so bright a turn in the preceding years. Tasso addressed his patron, Alfonso d'Este, the Duke of Ferrara, as follows. It well accords with reason that, if at peace Christ's holy folk should find itself some day, ready to make the fierce Turk release by force of ships and steeds his unjust prey, Earth's scepter should be yours, or, if you please, yours on the seas the undisputed sway. Meanwhile, be you as Godfrey, the first crusader ruler of Jerusalem, was of yore. Attend my song, and gird yourself for war. However, as opposed to Dupleo's relatively faithful translation, in Tasso's hands, the history of the crusade is transformed into an, an impassioned heroic poem, as he called it, in which the crusaders are not only pious knights, but also courtly lovers, who must fight not to be swept away by the magic and adventure with which the Holy Land, the goal of their journey, overflows. As the crusaders advance towards Jerusalem, their amorousness quickly threatens to distract them from their goal. The poem's protagonist, Tancredi, the historical crusader Tancred de Hauteville, falls in love with the Saracen warrior Clorinda, whom he first sights near a well. There will at once appear to him a maid clad in full armor, all except her face. Pagan she was, she too had sought the shade to find, like him, refreshment in that place. He saw her, he admired, he surveyed her fair semblance. He burned for it a pace, O oh, marvelous love, scarcely born, takes wing at once full grown in arms and triumphing. Tancredi relentlessly pursues his heroic beloved on and off the battlefield. His ardent love turns into mourning when he mistakenly kills her after, he, after she has burned the Christian siege tower before the walls of Jerusalem. Furthermore, the Saracen sorceress, Armida, sent to sow discord among the Christians, seduces another important character, Rinaldo, originally intending to kill him. Instead, she falls in love with him and, Circe-like, takes him to the Fortunate Isles, where he must be saved by his companions. Only after his escape from the control of Armida and the end of Tancredi's preoccupation with Florinda are the Christian forces reunited in their common purpose, able to conquer Jerusalem. Jerusalem delivered imagines the Holy Land as a realm of love, magic, and adventure. The world of the chivalric romances, the tales of Lancelot, Tristan, and Amadis of Gaul that drive Don Quixote mad. In Tasso's work, the Holy Land is not merely the subject of conquest, but fights back. He threatens to drown the crusaders in their amorousness and divert them from their purpose. That threat can be averted only by turning love into conquest, and the women of Jerusalem and the Liberata are one for Christianity. Florinda accepts baptism before dying, and Armida converts out of love for Rinaldo. As the land is taken by the Christians, so are the women, women Christianized, and love itself becomes a tool of acquisition, just like the sword. 
The crusader struggle of the licentiousness of the, uh, licentiousness of the land is therefore both domesticating and salvific. As Christian host conquers Saracen land, Christian man conquers Saracen woman, and both can now enter the celestial as well as the earthly Jerusalem. Tasso's union of crusade history with chivalric romance is to a certain extent paradoxical. After all, the crusades were journeys undertaken for religious purposes, to expiate the sins of human existence. Romances speak of courtly love, that is, such as in the case of Lancelot and Guinevere, or Tristan and Isolde, adulterous or extramarital, and technically sinful. One part of Tasso's poem therefore invalidates the other. However, if Tasso's approach to the crusade is remarkable, it is not as original as is often thought. 200 years earlier already, in the 14th century, works that sought to incite Western Europe to continue to fight against its non-Christian enemies had invoked chivalric romance to achieve their goals. Not every crusade was as successful as the first. Rather, the conquest of Jerusalem was followed by centuries of defeat and disappointment that by 1291 reduced Western Christian dominion in the Middle East to nothing. Under these circumstances, when it was not altogether clear whether or not God really wanted the crusade to continue, it was not easy to convince, to convince Western military men to risk life and limb on the edges of Christianity. To make the Holy War more appealing to them, preachers and propagandists therefore began to associate the crusade with chivalric romance, a literary genre popular with the very military men, like Cervantes as Quixote later, knights, um, upon whose martial abilities the success of the Crusades had depended for centuries. For reasons that I unfortunately cannot discuss here, but about which I would be very happy to talk to you at great length later on, um, in the 14th century, uh, the Western European chivalric aristocracy, the military class of knights, was also more, far more willing to take chivalric literature seriously than it had ever before. Whereas it had for centuries used the stories of Arthur, Lancelot, and Gawain for entertainment or inspiration in play acting and festivities, the 14th century saw it turn to these imaginary tales as historic in uh, instances of exemplary conduct to be imitated if one wanted to be a good knight. Handbooks or manuals of chivalry were written that urged young knights to follow in the footsteps of Gawain or Palamedes and to be inspired to great adventures by courtly love for ladies. Chivalric orders, the most famous of which was the Order of the Garter, which even now exists, were created in imitation of the Order of the Round Table and to urge its members to follow the example of the Knights of King Arthur. Cleverly playing upon this, crusade propaganda started to identify the battlefields of the Holy War as a place where one could indeed imitate Lancelot or Gawain, or even meet Arthur for that matter, and thereby reach the pinnacle of chivalric excellence. Circa 1340, for instance, the order of warrior monks known as the Teutonic, or German order, which had originated in the Holy Land but had moved its activities to the Baltic borderlands between Germany and Lithuania, turned to chivalric romance with a vengeance. <coughs> the order's attempts to, uh, attempts to carve out their own state had long been stymied by lack of military strength, and they therefore increasingly relied upon the Western Crusaders to help them fight the pagan Lithuanians. In trying to convince these Westerners to come to their cold, barren corner of the world, where campaigning was difficult and the enemy notoriously ferocious, the order started to identify their lands as a place where one could do the things that knights of chivalric literature did. It was, for instance, the best place to rescue damsels in distress. If you wanted to be like Lancelot, freeing aristocratic ladies from the clutches of dastardly villains, the Baltic frontier was the place for you. The Order's propagandists, such as Nicholas of Yeroshin, implored upon their audience to take pity on the damsels captured by Lithuanians, I quote. It was pitiful to see these noble women who had been brought up as gentlewomen and now had to suffer such painful humiliation and were brutally forced to work. The identification of the crusade frontier with the geographical location of romance could even be more explicit. For instance, the mid-14th century work known as the Bataille de Bouillon lists the cities of the Levant encountered by the crusaders when, I quote, they conquered the temple of Salomon, Nicaea, Antioch, Acre, Tyre, Ascalon, La Forbie, and the city of Avalon. Virtually all of these cities were wrested from the Muslims by the first crusade, and they are mentioned in historically logical succession. Avalon, of course, is another matter. It is the final resting place of Arthur, now located in the Middle East. The work furthermore places the realm of Arthur in Egypt, and has the king of Jerusalem, Baldwin II, meet the once and future king when he crosses the Red Sea. What then does all this mean for the man from La Mancha? When Cervantes wrote Don Quixote, telling the amusing tale of an old man who takes chivalric romance far more seriously than common sense dictates, 
He did so in a world that had for centuries taken chivalric romance far more serious than common sense dictate. The import of romance was strongest on the way Western Europe defined what lay beyond its borders. This had been historically the case for the lands of the pagan Lithuanians in the Muslim occupied Holy Land. And that this was still the case in Cervantes' time is shown by the fact that Tasso's heroic poem continues the identification of the Middle East with the world of love, magic, and adventure. However, this identification of foreign shores with the world of romance did not only look at the battlefields of Crusades past, it also notably affected how the conquerors of the New World classified what they saw. One of the works that drive Quixote over the edge is a 14th century romance entitled Amadis of Gaul. This text also appears to have come to mind to the Spanish conquistadores who ravaged Mexico. Bernal Díaz del Castillo, a soldier who took part in the conquest of the Aztec capital Tenochtitlan, the present-day Mexico City, describes it as follows. Next morning, we came to a broad causeway and continued our march towards Itzapalapa. And when we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and one other great towns on dry land, and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, we were astounded. These great towns and temples and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, seemed like an enchanted vision from the tale of Amadis of Gaul. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was all not a dream. This sort of thinking also affected your present-day United States. For instance, you may or may not know that the state of California is named after the island of California, ruled, uh, sorry, ruled by Queen Calafia, in a, romance called, in a romance called The Adventures of Espandian, the sequel to Amadis of Gaul. In other words, even though Don Quixote is described as eccentric in Cervantes' work, his preoccupation with chivalric romance was far from uncommon, and this, of course, would be the broad target of Cervantes' satire. However, the fact that chivalric romance was taken seriously, especially with regard to crusade in contact with non-Western countries, might also point in another direction. Maybe Don Quixote is also a satire of the way works like Tasso of Jerusalem delivered imagined interreligious conflict and intercultural contact. Like Tasso's great poem, Don Quixote discusses a hero traversing what was an active crusade battlefield in earlier times. La Mancha was at one point in called Al Mancha, or the wilderness in Arabic, before its conquest by the Christian Spanish in the middle of the 13th century. Its hero, too, is clad in crusaders' arms. He is a Hidalgo, a descendant of the fighting class that had wrested the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors, who dons his grandfather's arms and armor, a weapon that, given that Quixote is middle-aged when the tale begins, most likely last saw action in the later stages of the Reconquista. Not only is Quixote therefore a sad echo of a Romance knight, he is also a sad echo of a crusader. With this in mind, one could ask if Don Quixote de la Mancha did not as much set out to imitate Lancelot or Amadis of Gaul as to follow in the footsteps of Tancredi or Rinaldo from Tasso's great work. As said, Cervantes knew and admired Tasso. Perhaps he opposed Tasso's heroic poem Jerusalem delivered with an unheroic prose Don Quixote. Quixote then presents himself as a Tancredi betrayed by his environs, made a fool by time and space. He wanders through a land where there are no more Muslims to find, and where the wizards and the giants have all passed in the mid into the mist of time, an obsessed, mad 50-year-old man destined for an early grave, quite like the quality of Tasso himself. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you so much, Stefan. So, we move now to chapter two. And indeed, it's to movement in general that we wish to turn. Don Quixote has been adapted into operas, musicals, and ballets. Dance has especially been an intriguing medium in which to tell the story of Don Quixote, though it's been challenging as well. A thousand-page novel starring an elderly man who falls off his horse as much as trots along on him does not immediately lend itself to adaptation in brilliant, athletic, physical dance. There have been beautiful and wondrous results at times, to be sure, but the final product is often something that seems to be taking place in the universe of Quixote, rather than something mirroring the narrative in any meaningful way. Tonight, we wish to embrace this fact rather than lament it not trying to tell the story of the novel by means of dance, but instead letting the novel speak through movement, 
letting its themes and meta-themes manifest themselves in bodies as they move in space. The first section of dance will be performed this evening by Danielle Meyer. Danielle is an adjunct professor of philosophy here at DePaul University, as well as the artistic director of Aleph World Fusion Dance, a deep and creative thinker on many fronts, as well as a talented dancer and performer. We're very pleased to have her with us this evening. The second and third dances will be performed by Wendy Clenard, with assistance from her daughter, Sophia Clenard Rubio. Wendy is the founder and artistic director of Clenard Dance, a true jewel in the Chicago dance community that specializes in contemporary dance rooted in flamenco. Wendy is an amazing choreographer and teacher, as well as dancer, having created and performed six full evening works over the last 16 years. She's performed around the world, has taken flamenco and dance in general in exciting and original directions, and we're honored to have her with us this evening as well. As we watch these dance performances within the context of Quixote, I just suggest we keep a couple of thoughts in mind. Quixote himself is a man caught in a time that's out of joint. He lives in the past, reading tales of chivalry long gone, as Stefana showed us, though we must remember that even this past world itself was but a fiction. Quixote embraces anachronism. He mixes time period, styles, and attitudes, and Cervantes does the same. In the dances that you're about to see, we have attempted to do the same. Though everything has been grounded in the dance traditions of Spain, we recognize that Spain is and was, even in Cervantes' time, something of a cosmopolitan and eclectic place. In the first piece that you'll see performed, the sounds of court dance, the kind that would have been popular with nobility in the early 1600s, can be heard in faint echoes at the start, though they are mixed with Romani gypsy sounds of a different peasant class as well. You'll see in the first part of Danielle's dance the classic tropes of court dance of the time, the dancer presenting herself, bowing, acting civilized and proper. But like Quixote, she will be bowing to windmills, imagining unseen dance partners on the floor where she stands alone. Gradually, the music and movement will change. A mysterious mood emerges in which an energy that transcends class and perhaps even time takes hold of the body, and the dancer is less human and more serpent or dragon-like moving to the rhythms that will found the gypsy belly dance tradition. Like Quixote, who sees the mystery of the world that others cannot see, Danielle concludes with a question rather than a statement. We must remember, too, that the story of Quixote is, in fact, the story of movement. It is, in one sense, a sort of travel narrative, even if it is Quixote alone who understands his journey. And so, as Wendy takes the stage, she will first perform a solea, the solea, which finds its etymological roots in loneliness, is from the deep song branch of flamenco, the branch that's dedicated to the most existential human themes of loss, longing, and madness. The second piece that Wendy will be dancing for us moves us from perceived madness to the night's eternal quest, set to the music of Roberto Sierra's Fandangos for Orchestra, composed just 15 years ago. The dan dance is both gestural and deconstructed, taking flamenco, a dance tradition that of course was not around in Quixote's time, into the bodies, traditions, and histories that ground it. The music has been praised by critics as a postmodern masterpiece, mixing two different 18th century versions of triple meter Spanish dance in order to create a pastiche of dance rhythms that demand constant adjustment by the dancer, even as patterns repeat in a bolero-like style and taking flamenco into new terrains where genre and times mix, and the very point of dance, of movement, of journeys, of the quest itself comes under scrutiny. Wendy thus brings our second chapter to a close by leading us atop a musical Rosinante into uncharted territory. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to present to you Daniel Meyer and Wendy Clenard.
Thank you so much. That was really beautiful. That was just gorgeous. Many thanks to, to Danielle and Wendy and also Sophie. Um, we're going to have the, the real uh, pleasure of getting to talk to them too, so I'll invite them back up here along with the rest of our panelists uh, for the discussion in, in just a bit. But we come now to uh, chapter three and the conclusion of our individual presentations with Stephen Miller, professor and director of graduate studies in the Department of Hispanic Studies at Texas A&M. Earning his degree in comp lit from the University of Chicago right here in town, Steve has taught at Texas A&M for 37 years and is the author and editor of numerous books and articles, several of which cemented him as one of the leading scholars of the work of Benito Perez Galdós, the 19th century Spanish novelist, often spoken of in the same reverent breath as Cervantes. We're very lucky to have Steve with us this evening to help us think a bit about the way in which the illustrators have interpreted and been inspired by Don Quixote and how these graphic depictions of the text have affected our reading of the text. I'm very pleased indeed to present to you with his lecture entitled, How Don Quixote Invites Dialogue and Conversation, Illustrators and Readers Respond, Professor Stephen Miller. Good evening, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Peter Steves and the Humanities Center for the invitation. Uh, my wife and I have a long history with Chicago, and uh, my history goes back even further, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, taking into account what Stefan was saying about the authoritarian tradition, and Peter about this being a postmodern work, Don Quixote, I'm, I'm taking up that theme in a, a different way. So, from the very beginning, the second chapter, we see uh, in the yellow highlighting that Don Quixote talks about the gracious history of my famous deeds being made known by a sage who will write it. And then later on, uh, also in yellow, uh, his adventures will also be made known by uh, by castings in bronze, uh, carvings in marbles, uh, by pictures. So, one thing that we see is that Don Quixote and Cervantes uh, looked upon what was going to happen as open to representation and therefore interpretation. The first example that is very, very striking of this, I'll just go ahead a little bit. So this, the first, the previous two slides are going to be uh, referring to this drawing. This drawing uh, occurs at a time when uh, there's a break in the novel's action, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But in any case, uh, one of the ways that uh, the novel, which has been ended and nothing else is left, is found, is when the author is, well, the second author, who we presume to be Cervantes, is in Toledo, and just by chance comes upon a boy selling papers, and therefore, uh, who's, uh, the author, the second author's interest is Pete, and it works out that the papers this young boy wants to sell to a, uh, a silk merchant, uh, contains a, a drawing, and the drawing is this drawing. <clears throat> well, a version of this drawing. <clears throat> so the drawing itself, in other words, chapter eight, last paragraph, is where the action breaks. So Don Quixote comes against the word Vizcaya. So this is where he's coming against him. And then there's a description of everything that happens. And, and I think everybody here remembers, well, from youth on, uh, I remember specifically Hardy Boy's Mysteries because they had a frontispiece illustration. And I was always very interested in seeing where the action in words uh, was and how well 
it was illustrated by the uh, frontispiece. But in any case, so we have a description here. And if you're a good reader of words and pictures together, you really want to uh, compare and contrast. And it goes on. But then it says, and this is the second slide of the last paragraph, but it spoils all that at this point in crisis, the manuscript ends. So we're left in the lurch with a verbal description. So this is the paragraph we find out about uh, the, the second author in Toledo and by chance coming upon uh, the, the manuscript. And what happens, and this was mentioned before, the, uh, the second author is curious about what this manuscript contains, and then he finds a Spanish-speaking, uh, I'm not remembering this, okay. okay. So right here, I looked about to see if there were any Spanish-speaking Morisco at hand. So these people, 100 years before, should have disappeared from the scene because they should have stopped uh, being interested in their own language and culture. But they, they still exist. And he actually mentions that you could find other languages, and he's referring to the Jews who, of course, in 1492, you had to either convert or leave Spain. So he does find somebody, and then the person starts to read. Uh, and then the, the, uh, the, the young translator, uh, this is Dulcinea de Globoso. So this is the first hint that there is something, uh, a continuation of the novel that's broken off. And then he has his whole reaction here. And then he buys the, uh, the, the papers, the manuscripts, and he uh, uh, will have them uh, translated. But what happens when he looks, the first thing he sees is that illustrated scene. But remember, that illustrated scene is, this is Doré's version from the 1860s. So one thing that happens, uh, we readers are, of illustrated versions are always comparing and contrasting what is being said in words and what the illustrator is doing. So that's why I refer to illustrators as, well, what happens between a text and an illustrator, sometimes in life, for example, all of Mark Twain's uh, novels in their first editions were illustrated editions. So you actually have a conversation, a live conversation between the illustrator and the uh, verbal artist, the uh, lexical author, about what's going on. But then you also see that uh, yeah, there are captions. Then uh, you actually have an exfraxis of the illustration, because of course the illustration that's found in Toledo is not reproduced. So Rocinante was marvelously portrayed. So something that happens, if you look at some of the illustrations that Peter was showing in the beginning, uh, you actually have a, a strong looking war horse. You don't have an emaciated steed that is uh, Rocinante in the verbal description. And then there's also this thing about Sancho Sancas and Panza. So Sancas would refer to long legs, Panza would refer to big belly. And there's no doubt that what comes to us in our time is a Sancho Panza who has a big belly but has short legs. But then um, something very interesting here happens. So he comments on the differences of names, but then says, some other trifling particulars might be mentioned, but they are all of slight importance and have nothing to do with the true relation of the history 
and no history can be bad so long as it is true. I think this is what Peter was referring to before. And exactly the opposite tradition, which uh, Stefan was dealing with, the, the authoritarian tradition of textual interpretation. So there we are. We, uh, and I'll just, Okay, so in terms of Don Quixote, remember we have the first author, Sidi Amete, the one who writes in Arabic. Then there's a second author, who we call Cervantes, I suppose, the Christian writing in Spanish. Then we have Don Quixote's ambition to have lexical and graphic chroniclers of his life. And then I'm making a big deal about that illustration that would ideally occur at the, between chapters 8 and 9. And what are we saying? Well, let's go back. There, there are different types of illustrations. Uh, documentary, it's uh, pretty straightforward. In other words, if we don't have documentary documents to see how people looked, we wouldn't know. So anybody who's doing a costume drama of any sort has to go back to the pictorial record to find out how they should dress people. Narrative. If you take a heavily illustrated uh, edition of any novel, all of Mark Twain's uh, novels were very heavily illustrated, uh, you can actually read the illustrations and follow the story extremely well. Then, uh, and of course, the Doré edition is very much like that, although there's some very, there are peculiarities about it. Then the interpretive, and this is probably uh, the most interesting in view of that, that section where we saw that the only thing that really counts is the truth. There can be differences about, about details, but we can still get to the truth. So portrays visually the characters through graphic presentation of their appearance. So should San Sancho have long legs and big belly? Or just big belly, short legs? Uh, gestures, attitudes towards others. Does not have to follow the words of the text. Very important. Then synthetic. Visually represents two or more of the other three kinds of illustrations. So if we start with uh, a person of great interest to the art world, but we already saw in Peter's slides that there are quite a few illustrations that include of Salvador Dali. At the beginning, we have one version of Don Quixote. Then we have another version. Then we. <laughs> We have another. Then we're back to Doré. So that's Doré's version, a very famous version of the attack on the windmills. And we see our friend Sancho over there pulling his hair out. But so the Doré illustration is as if we were looking at the scene. With Dali, we're trying to get into the mind of the man who is trends making a different version of what everybody else would say. So this is the uh, Doré edition of the Tack on the Sheep. Then uh, Salvador Dali once again trying to get into the mind of the character. So in many ways, uh, I've said everything that I have to say, but I would state that the more a writer thinks about his work, perhaps in the terms of Stephen Daedalus, I'll create, I'll forge in the smitty of my soul, the new consciousness of my race. That is exactly the opposite of Cervantes' view of his, uh, of what he was doing. And when uh, P 
Peter mentioned before the Avellaneda uh, version. I, I'm not sure, Peter, it was so much a matter of uh, he was claiming proprietary rights over the character, but that Avellaneda's character was false to the person that had been created in the first version. So this would come down to the truth. Was, was the third, what was the Avellaneda version truthful to the character? So Cervantes is interested in truth, but he's not authoritarian about it. He's not creating the truth. He is, in fact, providing a place where we can come together and consider things of importance to us human beings and how we perceive the world. And then what illustrators do is, first of all, they dialogue with the writer. Then we, as uh, readers of both words and pictures, begin the conversation. And that's exactly what Peter has said of the time, this conversation about what's going on in this book with this character. And those illustrations come contrasting Doré's illustrations with Dali's uh, illustrations. We see, do we look at him from outside, or do we try to look from inside? And I think that's the, the what we're talking about this evening. OK, thank you. Very much, Steve. So now we want to uh, bring, in some senses, the most important part of the evening, I think. We'd like to bring everybody together and get a chance for you to get in the conversation so that we can really think communally uh, about this and some of the issues that are raised together. So I'm going to ask uh, all of our presenters and our dancers to come out on stage, and we'll get set up, and we'll be uh, underway in just a second. Hi, thank you very much. I enjoyed the dance and the presentation. And while it's still fresh in our mind, uh, Stephen, um, no, I'd like to ask about that Dali attack on the sheep. Um, your interpretation of Dali's interpretation, I hadn't seen that before, and I've seen a number of Dali's uh, illustrations, but this one where the sheep is asleep in his head, is this how you take it? And I wondered if you could talk about that specifically. Um, is he, um, imagine, in, Seems you know he's not he's seeing an army, uh, but what's happened to the sheep? Sort of back, you know, asleep, I, 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 top I of his head. I don't want to sort of talk out, but uh, I, I think that this this illustration, the, the two colored illustrations plus the two pen uh, and ink illustrations, are from a uh, 1947 modern library edition, and. Uh, the curious thing about the edition is that it is not profusely illustrated, but it is illustrated in that way that illustrated that you have different renditions of Don Quixote and Sancho. And you have in color and then in black and white. So I think that when I have come upon, and then the thing is the illustrations are out of order sometimes. So, People say, oh, well, that's surrealism. I, I think this had to do with uh, the sloppy composition of the book to turn the But the thing is that even if they're in place, it'd be 40 or 50 or 60 pages away from what's being illustrated. So you can look at it different ways, but I, I think that if you're trying to get in t inside the mind of Don Quixote, which that is what that illustration is about, uh, you, you can come up with a, uh, an interpretation. But I think the thing is that what it does is make you go back over everything that's happening. So uh, I, I, I don't want to give a specific interpretation, but to say that it seems like Don Quixote is empty-headed in some way, right? And that he sees reality. But what we cannot explain, what Salvador Dali does not try to explain, is what is the process by which Don Quixote transforms reality? And then, of course, in that, that you have the beans. And beans have all sorts of symbolism. 
So are these the germs of Don Quixote's thought? And that you have the sheep, <laughs> and then this is what comes out. I, I think that uh, beyond what I've said, I would just assume the posture of Dali. I, I just let the illustration speak for itself. But at the same time, that draws us back to the words. We go back and forth. That, that's the way we're going back. It's not helpful. My question is more historical, and that is, I recently learned that Cervantes was a prisoner of the, uh, well, I'm not sure what they were called then, but certainly what we call the Barbary Pirates. <laughs> um, so how, since you guys are far more learned than I am, or I'm not learned at all in this matter, how did that affect his work, and I would imagine anyone who has suffered and is a great thinker has great compassion and insight. So I believe the period was seven years, which is a long time, and he tried to escape three times, something like that. Uh, well, um, well, off the top of my head, I can probably assume that there might be a parallel between the time they was in imprisoned by, by the Barbary pir pirates, as you said, which because of the arrangements that had existed in the Mediterranean means that he could be legally enslaved by his captain, which was what he was for that period of time until he was you know, bought free by his parents and the Trinitarian order. Um, but effectively, the parallel could be that when he wrote Don Quixote, um, he was also in prison because after his um, career in the army, he became a, a man who procured um, particular goods for the Spanish army. And his accounts didn't, didn't, didn't match up, so he ended up spending a recurring uh, amount of time in, in prison, and that is where he wrote Don Quixote. And I imagine that um, maybe the parallel could be that he f needed to find ways to entertain himself. I mean, there are, um, um, and, and therefore he came up with um, a tale that um, he originally envisaged as something that would be funny to do while he was in prison, and therefore it could be, as you say, substantially older than his background as well. That is a possibility. Um, I, I generally don't. Um, this is a terrible thing to say, but I haven't, I haven't been in prison, so I don't really know how that affects people or their ability to write um, um, tales or, or, um, or, or, or even their sense of compassion. So that, I'm afraid, I don't know if I can totally answer correctly. Um, maybe Professor Miller would be able to. The only thing I'd say about that is that there is one of the uh, intercalated novels called The Story of the Captive, and that's the story of a successful escape from the Barbara Ripaya pirates. But it's affected in part by the uh, daughter of one of these men, who, uh, for reasons that are more or less explained, uh, wants to become Christian. So uh, they run off together to Spain and live a happily ever after. <laughs> so I don't know uh, if Cervantes, uh, beyond what Stefano already said, was sort of. Uh, wouldn't it have been nice if I had escaped? <laughs> and in fact, I'd had a nice, happy life in the Well, so um, I haven't been a prisoner either. I've known a few prisoners. My father was a political prisoner. He never starved, though. And so I'm wondering what we are calling now postmodern is just part of the stress of isolation, starvation. Um, that we've transformed into something else. I, I don't know what Cervantes' conditions were, but from reading about the conditions of the people, and, and I, as I recall later on, he was um, a prisoner of the Inquisition, I think is what you're referring to. No, not, not, not the Inquisition. No. It, it, was, it was civil. Yeah. It was civil or matters, OK. So I'm not so a scholar of this, but I'm thinking, what I've heard from political prisoners is that they haven't, and he was a slave, or in similar conditions. So, so I'm saying we're considering it postmodern, and maybe it was really something else. Well, the thing is, uh, where, where the Inquisition comes into this whole, I think for most people, is because of the 
men from La Mancha that had sta has staged versions, and then, of course, the very uh, well-known movie version with Peter O'Toole and Sophia Loren. And the Don Quixote story is actually acted out in an Inquisition jail. But that has little to do with Cervantes' own story. But that is a very powerful image. I think the question is, is if you take, I mean, what is a movie? In a sense, a movie is an illustrated version of a novel. So would Cervantes have been upset? So I think Cervantes was genuinely upset with the Avellaneda edition because it was false, to, it was not true to the characterization that the first volume had set up. But would he have been upset with Man from La Mancha? Uh, I don't think he would have been. I'm, I'm not talking about Man from La Mancha. I'm talking about the actual conditions that pol slaves, political prisoners, are, um, are subject to. And they, my, my husband was a psychoanalyst. He loved the Dali. Uh, illustrations and, and Don Quixote. So because of this transformative uh, possibility, but that's, that can be caused by stress and hunger as well. I just can have to speak more to it than I have. Just be, I only mentioned the Matthew Lunch because of, of the Inquisition was yeah. That was not part of uh, sort of this life in terms of I hope you don't mind if I ask another question. Uh, Stefan, um, given your approach to the uh, work here, um, looking at how literature inspired um, great and sometimes not so great deeds of violence, um, could you uh, talk about how uh, Don Quixote at the beginning sells his land in order to buy books? Um, it seems to, you know, this is something that I'm sure works well within your reading of the, of, I mean, that you can incorporate in your um, argument. Because there's a typical idea that this is going against who we should be. He's a man, a land of man, he's selling off reality to buy fiction and, you know, real estate. And he's, um, part of what defines him is the land that he owns um, as a nobleman. But it seems that there's a reverse, the reverse action is what um, you're getting at, that he's you know, buying something that inspires him to win his own land, that would lead him to action, that would act to, to make him really live out uh, the, the mission of his noble class. Um, actually, yeah. Um, just so, yeah, I come to think of it, as you were talking, that uh, something came up about. So, like, one of the reasons I didn't actually get to uh, go into why people in the Middle Ages started taking um, romance seriously was because of the changing role of the uh, chivalric aristocracy within 14th century society. It used to be, um, to put it mildly, that they controlled pretty much everything, both um, economical traffic and the way that wars were, uh, wars were waged. And as the 14th century comes along, not only do you have an increase or a decreasing role of um, heavy um, uh, cavalry in, in, in battlefield tactics, but you also have an increasing uh, rise of uh, of an urban middle class who bases their wealth on trade. So as their, you know, as their, the importance of their land becomes less important um, in controlling um, economical traffic, so they find other reasons why they are super special. And that is because, hey, look, um, for the past couple of hundred years, people have been writing books about people like us, and that means that we are particularly um, um, remarkable within the history of the past couple of centuries. And, um, the strange thing, of course, is that on, on his, in his own way, Quixote does the same. He uh, trades whatever sort of like you know um, um, economical holding he has for an imagined um, form of you know um, of exceptionality, which uh, by itself should yield its own rewards as a result of adventure. And that is, you know, of course, you know, it's hard to put an immediate, I mean, direct parallel into a closer study of the text involved. But this, of course, this is something that. Um, that Quixote uh, actually uh, echoes 14th century aristocratic behavior. Um, I hope that that helps to answer your question. I would just add to that that it seems that he's not satisfied with his status. This land 
Actually, it's not very important to it. That's why it's worth the salt. Mm. Hi, thank you for your, your talks and performances. Uh, I mean, I've got a great deal of literary disorder interest in uh, Theodore's solid 18th century literature and its relation to picaresque and all of this. But, well, sitting here uh, tonight and watching the performances, listening to the talks, looking at all the graphic art, um, with paintings from the late 19th century, you have Dali's work from the 60s, you have some sculptures from the new millennium. And it just, um, I was wondering if I could hear some reflections from you on you know, why do you think Quixote still remains such a fertile source of inspiration for such a variety of, of art forms, not just literary, of course, but visual and other art forms? Well, beyond the fact that it's a funny book ever written. Uh, anyway. What? Oh, it's the funniest book ever written. I don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 it never, it's, it's like, you know, I know that Jack Handy wrote one book of 120 pages of one minor, which might have more condensed comedic density than Don Quixote, but that was probably the only one. I mean, there's no page that goes by without five or six really funny moments, which is, I think, the reason people still like reading it. And if you like reading it, then hence the rest of us. Well, I think what happens, uh, that there was a, an interview with uh, Radio De Paul on Friday, which we both participated with uh, Derek Peters. and. Uh, one of the things that came out is that it's possible that Don Quixote was going to be another one of Cervantes' exemplary novels, fairly short, uh, flat characters, not round characters. And what, what changed was uh, Sancho Panza coming into the mix. Therefore, you have the first bloody narration. And this conversation that goes on between them, uh, I, I could have mentioned in my talk, but I didn't, that the buddy conversation actually takes up what Cervantes himself lays way for in the second chapter of wanting these chronicles, of wanting people to observe and then to create artistic versions of it. And I think the thing about the novel is and this, once again, I'm sorry, I can't keep on coming back. The thing about the Avignaneda, in its own way, it's a fine book. It's just, it's not true to the characterizations because in Avignaneda, uh, Sancho is just a fool. But in Don Quixote, the first part of Cervantes, the second part, you have this conversation where each man is reflecting on what's happening, and then they're talking with each other, and they, there's a big change in each one as a result of the process. So I think that if you go to the 18th century English novel, for example, uh, there, there are sidekicks also in those novels. And I think that part of the openness of the novel, uh, either through illustration, or through reinterpretation, or using it as inspiration for is that it, it just opens people up to, and this then does refer to computer and to stuff, this not authoritarian way of, of telling a story, of, of looking at human experience, of seeing it as a process, not as a trip from point A to point B as fast as you can get there, but actually smelling the roses, as you go along, and, and what the experience is of, of, of that journey. So not, 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 not the destination, but the trip, something like that. And I think maybe I would add, only add to that that I, I don't think, I doubt whether we're going to, we would end up disagreeing that much, Steve, because to me that the point of the point is that it's calling into question how we establish truth itself. So whether or not Cervantes is upset about the authorship or whether he's upset about the truth of the character, this truth is up for grabs. And, and maybe in some ways this, this is kind of the postmodern condition for us too, because there are all these narratives that we're playing out. We have all these stories about who we are, and we're always trying to say, am I, am I being true? 
to, to these stories? It, is this something that I would do? That's sometimes a question we ask ourselves when we're in an ethical moment. And it's not to refer to anything outside of ourselves, but it's to try to pull those very loose strands of identity together into a weave that tells a, a continual story. And if I can maybe twist that into a question for, for Wendy and Danielle uh, a little bit, um, when I was looking just again at the, the Dali that we had up here with the, the sheep, one thing that occurred to me was that um, my, since my own training is in phenomenology, and so and I, I saw from the back of Dali's head there, I thought it was very interesting, we're seeing from the back of his head, so not something he would see, but as if we're seeing through that and then through into the world. And I think of somebody like um, Martin Heidegger, for instance, who talks about various comportments and ways of being in the world. So an example that he'll give is something like when you're afraid, that it's not that there's just uh, fear and then there's the rest of your experiences in the world, but there's this fear that is sort of filling your mind such that it's a filter by which everything you see ends up coming onto you as that which is fearful. It's a way of being in the world. And so maybe one of the things that Dali is getting at is that that sheep that's just filling up his mind completely, that that kind of madness, but also seeing the possibility of, of something to fight and also knowing that it's not necessarily the thing that you think that you're fighting, that that kind of way of being in the world shows that splintered identity that's, that's at work there. And so one of the things that it made me think about with the dance, for instance, is how it is that you, we try to embody um, these narratives and embody ourselves. So in thinking of the dances as a kind of illustration of Dali, but more like a Dali, uh, the illustration of Quixote, but more like a Dali one, so not telling the narrative story, but getting at something that's going on. I, I wonder if uh, either one of you, Danielle or Wendy, might uh, tell us a little bit about what it is to be in the mind of a dancer. So when you are performing, is it the case that you think about the history of these movements and the way in which you're a part of that long history? Is that something that you shouldn't be thinking about because it should just always be there already in your training? Is it the emotion or the comportment that you want to portray and not just a particular move, but you want to get the fact that there is that loneliness and loneliness is close relation to madness and the solea. Is there something that you can tell us more about your sort of mental comportment that we see there so beautifully in the flesh? Um, I had like a bunch of things when you were asking all of those things. I'll see what's left over. But um, namely, I think when it comes to the moment of dancing, there's a process that's different. You know, um, analyzing is one thing, dancing is another thing. Uh, they, they meet up at a, I mean, they're, they're, they're separate processes. So I think when you start to research and start to think about um, what you do as a dancer, there's like, I use cue cards, so there's the historical stuff, and it, depending on whatever it is, there are many things, colors, um, soundscapes, um, time periods, and, and then you, you kind of start to think of where they might match up, et cetera. But when you, when you dance, it's closer to the smelling the roses thing. You said, you, when you dance, you just dance. And um, there's nothing um, um, linear, at least I speak for myself anyway. Um, that, that has happened before. Um, oh, oh, I do want to say one thing, though. So when Peter uh, asked me to do this, I said, I don't know, go read that down before we get to the time. And I was like, whoa, I can't believe it. It's nothing like in high school when they made you read it. This is so incredible. And I thought of Confederacy of Dunces. And then I had a friend come from India, and I'm like, you got to see the Blues Brothers or Blues Brothers or something. Everyone's got to see. Huh. It's on Quixote. <laughs> and I will say one thing. Um, is, uh, as an artist, as, a, as just choosing it as a vocation, I can really relate to that. Um, like, yes, I, yes, I'm in it. You know, this like, you're doing what? <laughs> you know, in different, uh, d things have come back over the, yeah, I'm in my 40s, I'm still doing it. Yeah, I have a child. But, you know, this like, what? And you're like, play dumb, or just go along with it, or invent yourself along the way. And you're doing it, and, and some of that absurdity and that, um, well, I haven't figured it out yet, but, so I could really appreciate some of those moments um, 
to just reading an identity and I'm sure you can. <laughs> Um, I think in dancing, in terms of dancing, you're thinking of a lot of things at once. Some of it not pretty. I mean, you're thinking of like, don't trip, don't fall, <laughs> and all those sorts of things. But I think with, with Don Quixote, um, I think it's very similar to Moby Dick in that it's really quite a weird novel, and people don't talk about the weirdness as much as I think that they should. Um, and there's a feeling, I think, when you think about the characters, um, and so for me, I wasn't really thinking about the history necessarily or trying to tell a story. I, I tend to not care to do that in my own dancing, which is sort of engender a sort of a particular feeling. And for this was just um, try a, a weirdness, I guess. I was trying to sort of replicate what, to me, Cahody um, feels like when I read it. That's, that's an interesting point. Uh, yeah, Aristotle's poetics is the first theory of literature that we have. And he, he differenti differentiates, differentiates among the, the, the genres by what? By the effects they produce. So in a sense, the story is just a way to produce an effect. And the effect is what we treasure. Mm -hmm. Of course, certain stories produce the effects more intensely than others, but it's the effect we can. Thanks. And I think Wendy's given us a, a reason now to have another Ben and Quixote and scream the Blues Brothers <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> They're on a mission from God. <laughs> Jake and I would say it all the time. Thank you so much for staying with us, those of you who stayed it to the very last. Please join me one last time in thanking all of our presenters. And thank you for joining us here tonight as well. Good night, everybody.